Larry Page and Sergey Brin started out wanting to index the world's information. That idea has become a $450 billion company and the biggest internet brand in the world. Then came drones, robots, self-driving cars, Google Glass, virtual reality, curing death, and now a radical reorganization that is one nod to Wall Street and another nod to the future, Alphabet. On this special edition of Bloomberg West, we go in-depth on a bet to change the world, not once, but many times over. I'm Emily Chang, and this is a special Bloomberg West delivering Alphabet. Meet the new Google. Coming up, what is possible at Alphabet now that wasn't possible at Google before? We look at new financial options. Plus, could T be for Twitter, or is it Tesla? Why we could see Alphabet make big ticket acquisitions. And how much is riding on moonshots? Is significantly extending human life even possible? All of that ahead on this special Bloomberg West. First, though, let me tell you about Alphabet, the holding company and under which Google is now just another branch. Alphabet is all that we once thought of as Google, but separated into clear units. There's Fiber, the cable and internet provider, Nest, the connected home device maker, Calico, the biotech firm trying to cheat death, Ventures and Capital, the investment arms betting on early and late stage companies, and X, home of the moonshots. But the core money-making business still lives as Google. Some are calling it classic Google. It includes Search, Android, YouTube, maps and it's now being led by Larry Page's chosen one Sundar Pichai. In his 11 years at the company Pichai launched Chrome, took over Android operations and most recently nearly all of Google's consumer products. Joining me now to discuss what this restructuring means, how this uh, how the business will help accomplish new things, uh, Bloomberg Business Week's Brad Stone, True Ventures partner Om Malik and former Google Europe COO Ben Legg. I want to start with you Brad. Obviously you and Om covered Google for many many years years. What is possible? What can Larry and Sergey do now that they couldn't do before? Why did they have to go this far? Well, you know, arguably nothing <laughs> that they haven't already been doing. But look, ever since Larry was appointed CEO now uh, a couple of years ago, he has shown a little bit of a distaste for the grittier responsibilities of being chief executive. You know, talking to shareholders, being on that quarterly conference call, talking to regulators, testifying before Congress, talking to advertisers. And that's why gradually we've seen him hand off more responsibility to Sundar Pichai. I think what this allows him to do, and Sergey's already been doing it at Google X, Larry's probably been very jealous, is to focus on the future, to look at what the next twist is in technology, to focus on that and to let Sundar handle all the stuff that he hasn't wanted to do. Oh, um, you wrote that you don't envy Sundar. It's not an easy job that he's taken on. I, I do feel that the classic Google is under attack for the first time in a very very systematic way from all corners. I don't think people seem to quite understand how deep the attack is from Facebook, you know, from Apple, from Amazon Web Services. Google is a company which doesn't do anything really well. It is a fact. It's wow, not. wait, Google is maybe, a company uh, that search. doesn't do anything really well. Because search, they won the business, they won the category, and so they just look at the search results, look at search performance, look at how we as human beings use Google search, and we have nothing exciting to say about it. We don't love it the way we used to hmm. when this company started. Ben, as someone who worked at Google, the COO of Google Europe, how, how do you respond to that statement that Google doesn't do a single thing well? Uh, I think that there's many elements of truth to that. I mean, I see Google as, as the main thing they do really well is what I call universal search. If you don't know where to look for something, you go to Google. But you know, vertical by vertical, other companies are picking off interesting bits of search. You know, hotel search might be booking.com, uh, flight search might be uh, you know, uh, kayak or something like that. Um, you know, product search could be Amazon. And so there is a risk that Google gets chipped away at by lots of specialists who do a better job than them. Uh, I might argue that I think Google Maps, in my mind, are probably still the best maps in the world too, but there's right. definitely a risk that um, they've been doing a lot of things quite well. There's a lot of people who may be not as hungry as they could have been. The company's been maybe too big and bureaucratic to, okay. to be a, an innovator. 
So there's the why, but what about why now? What does this have to do with regulation, with what's going on with, with Europe and the antitrust battles there, with you know needing to be more nimble and, and, and maybe actually make it in a place like China, Brad? Sure, well, in fact, you, you know, our, 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 on, in Business Week on the antitrust battles, uh, you know, Larry and Sergey want nothing to do with uh, the antitrust problems in Europe. In, in the U.S., they're in the clear. Uh, Eric Schmidt, for the past five years, has been has been running that uh, game plan. It hasn't been that successful, no, no fault of Eric's, but the political political situation toward U.S. internet companies in Europe is terrible. Sundar is known inside Google as the peacemaker. I mean, he came into Android uh, when Android was fighting under Andy Rubin with a lot of other divisions at Google and basically integrated it into the company. He's done it again and again. I think Sundar will take an increased role in trying to navigate Google th through what is now a serious situation in Europe. Quickly, Om, is this, does Ruth Porat, the new CFO, does she have anything to do, that, do with this? How much of this is because of pressure from Wall Street? I think there is enough pressure from the Wall Street that they acknowledged it in an SEC letter. They had to defend themselves. Google founders didn't really give a damn about Wall Street for the longest time. They actually had to file a letter with the SEC and, and where they defended themselves against what investors were saying. Why is this company not focusing? I think investors were right in asking where is the focus. I think investors were wrong for making them focus on the near term. I think a lot of technology companies suffer because they are forced to focus on the near term by Wall Street, which has a very industrial era right. understanding of business. And now they're saying, well, hey, we're not going to accept at Google, but that's Sundar's job. Yeah. Okay, Brad Stone of Bloomberg Business Week, O Malik of True Ventures, you're sticking with us. Ben Legg, CEO of Ad Knowledge, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Um, another developing story we have to mention China surprising global investors by devaluing its currency the most in two decades. U.S. and global stocks tumbled on this move, concerned that China is headed for a greater slowdown. But the U.N. cut could be a welcome move to two of Apple's suppliers, Han Hai, a.k.a. Foxconn, and Pegatron. Both of these companies pay a major share of their workforce in U.N. and sell in U.S. dollars. A devalued U.N. may boost gross margins at both companies, even in the face of a potential slowdown in iPhone sales in China. Up next, could Alphabet free up Google, I mean Alphabet, to go on a buying spree? We'll look at all possible acquisition targets. Plus, should Amazon or Facebook take a page out of Google's Alphabet playbook? Are they all ready? Welcome back to our Bloomberg West special on Alphabet, Google's new parent company. How will Larry Page and Sergey Brin run Alphabet? What new bets will they make? I spoke earlier to Xiaomi Global Vice President Hugo Barra, former Googler and frontman for Android. It's conceivable that Google could make, Google could make large acquisitions um, if, if they decide to. And not only in businesses that are directly related to what Google does today, uh, but why not enter entirely new areas, uh, not only sort of moonshot type investments, but, you know, there's nothing stopping Google with this option that they've created from buying, you know, operations focused businesses if they want to. For more now, I'm joined by Pivotal Research Group Senior Research Analyst Brian Weezer in Portland uh, and my guest host, Bloomberg Business Week's Brad Stone and True Ventures partner, O'Malik. Google now, excuse me, Alphabet has $70 billion on its balance sheet to spend. How will they spend it? Om, you, you had a few suggestions. I would say, you know, the, there's been a lot of talk about Google and Tesla in the past. There was some talk about, I think Ashley wrote a book about, and there's Ashley some- Ashley Vance. Of Ashley Vance of Bloomberg. Yeah, he, he pointed out that there was some talk of Google buying a Tesla. And I think it may actually be, uh, make a lot of sense for Google to actually take a big substantial, you know, position in Tesla, not entirely buy it outright, but let's say Google ends up owning 20, 30% of that company with Elon's ownership it removes a lot of unnecessary pressure from Wall Street mm. on the company to deliver short-term results. I think the transition we are going through in technology be, you know, it needs some long-term thinking. Tesla is not like something which can be judged on a three-month increment. So from that standpoint, I think that would make a lot of sense. I think is, 
I wonder, is T for Tesla or Twitter? I, I, I spoke with Chris Saka uh, a couple of months ago about this very thing. He suggests that Twitter would be an instant fit for Google. They haven't done social well at all. I think we can all agree. Well, I, I, I don't know, um, but as Twitter stock price declines, which it has over the past few months, and as it uh, searches ineffectually for a new CEO, it certainly does become more plausible that a company like Google could buy them. Brian, you cover both Google and Twitter. What do you think? How would you like to see Google spend this money? Well, um, I think the question is, what is the optimal capital allocation decision? Uh, it's safe to say that if you were to look at it solely on that basis, you would separate the advertising-related businesses and those which are directly ancillary, maybe, like Google Play, from the rest of it. Because while you might admire what they're trying to do, uh, from a capital efficiency perspective, from a uh, help let, allowing investors to invest their capital in identifiable, uh, distinct, and synergistic businesses, that's not what Google is. Uh, that said, they're not going to do it. Investors buy into Google knowing that they're buying the, the Larry Sergey and Eric company. Oh, we were about to talk about Spotify, which Hugo also mentioned in, in my interview with him earlier today. I think the, if you l read Larry's note, and I'm just going off, off that, right? Like, you go right towards the end, he talks extensively about betting founders and entrepreneurs with the long-term view. I mean, he is as clear as a day telling the world what he wants to do with the money they have, the kind of investments they want to make. Spotify will need Daniel Ek in order for it to work. It exactly. won't work without him. I wonder, does this structure make it more likely for an acquisition like that to happen where Daniel Ek can come in and still be CEO? Or Jack Dorsey, uh, for example? I think you look forward five years from now and when you look back, this would be the prototype architecture of a large old technology company figuring out how to expand opportunities for it. You know, I have said time and time again, Google still is a one-trick pony. Mm. They are trying to find the next horses. They can't buy talent like Facebook bought Oculus and retain it. Mm. That's the problem. And in this case, they can buy talent, let them be, but, and let them go. So, uh, Brad, I don't think if it's fair to say Zuckerberg, Google's a one-trick pony. Hang on, Brian. <laughs> Brian. Sure. Uh, Brad, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, if you're Jeff Bezos, what are you thinking right now? Well, you know, I'll just take a counterintuitive approach here to the answer. M maybe they're maybe they're excited about this. You know, Larry uh, is now elevating himself above the core business, um, bringing in potentially other other companies into the uh, alphabet umbrella, arguably taking their eye off off the ball, off the profit engine that is the search business and its ancillary businesses. Now, we haven't really spoken about Sundar, obviously an incredibly accomplished executive, but no match for a Bezos or a Zuckerberg who has the magic of an entrepreneurial founder. Maybe this is an opportunity where Larry starts to really look at other things, disassociates himself from the search business and we look back and say here's the moment where Google lost its focus. Brian, what do you have to say to that? This is the company that you cover. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess there's several comments. I, I, I did want to hit on the idea that this is Google's one-trick pony. I, I mean, last I checked, in my estimate, is Google Display Network is probably going to do $10 billion this year. If you look at all the successor entities related to DoubleClick, that's a massive business and an incredibly successful but, acquisition. But what about the, mobile? I mean, hasn't Google ceded, you know, a huge uh, portion of territory there to Facebook? You have to argue that if you're looking at purely mobile plays, their purchase of AdMob was one of the most successful acquisitions in the space. Because remember, when Facebook tells you what their quote-unquote mobile ad revenue is, that's an allocation of a budget that they get from an advertiser to a device. It's not about a mobile advertiser to a mobile device per se. Google is still, Google along with Facebook are the two hegemonic players in advertising. So quickly, so, um, so I, I would respond to that. Google and Facebook, if you want to measure them on any metric, it has to be on the attention graph. The attention of average consumer is increasingly on Facebook. So looking today, it seems all great and dandy, but looking forward, if people are spending more and more time in Facebook or in the so-called you know, communication apps like WeChat and WhatsApp and wh whatever, right? you start to see the people start, are shifting their time on Twitter to different platforms, which takes away from their core business of advertising. I say one trick pony, they do really good. Advertising, there is, there is no match of, for them just yet.
right. on, and on mobile, Facebook is ahead of them and they will continue to increase the lead because they have more personal data around that. And, and I believe you pointed out today that U.S. adults spend 20 minutes a day yeah. on Facebook and far less on Google. Okay, oh Malik, Brad Stone, you're sticking with me. Brian Weiser of Pivotal Research Group, thank you so much for joining us today on this special edition of Bloomberg West. Still ahead, Larry Page and Sergey Brin's plans to monetize Google's moonshots under the newly formed alphabet we will discuss. It is time now for the Daily Bite, one number that tells a whole lot. And today's bite is 57%. That is the decline analysts expect to see in Alibaba's quarterly revenue. The company will release earnings overnight. Yesterday, Baba announced a $4.5 billion uh, buy in Chinese electronics retailer Suning Commerce Group. Last year, the company also invested over $600 million in in-time retail, a company that operates department stores. Jack Ma and CEO Daniel Zhang are counting on international expansion outside of China to offset any slowdown in sales growth. Tomorrow, be sure to check out my interview with Alibaba CEO Daniel Zhang right here on Bloomberg Television. Now, back to our special show about Alphabet, the new holding company for Google. While search may keep the lights on, moonshot divisions like Google X are the heart and soul of this company, giving birth to some of Google's most famous projects like driverless cars and glass. I spoke to Google X founder Sebastian Thrun and asked him about Calico. So Calico did not come out of Google X, um, but it's another audacious moonshot. And I have to say, this is what I admire Google for. There's just no people around that live for 200 years. And we don't understand why. There's actually relatively little research done compared to, for example, research on curing cancer. So I think it's a perfectly fine proposition to say, let's give it a try. If Google succeeds in finding a, a, a remedy for old age dying, I would say they do something fantastic for the world. Joining me now to discuss, Ryan Bethencourt, Program Director at Indie Bio, a biotech accelerator. And back with me, Om Malik of True Ventures, Bloomberg Business Week's Brad Stone. Ryan, you know, it's interesting in that interview, Sebastian said he thinks we'll see the impact of Google's research in our lifetimes. Is it really possible to extend human life to 200 years? Without a doubt, right? So, so when you look at um, life extension, um, Cynthia Kenyon, which is actually one of the, the new hires over at Calico, she actually showed that she was able to double the lifespan of worms. Uh, with one gene mutation. So how are they doing this? Uh, what are people saying about Calico? It's like, it's the most opaque division of Google. Nobody knows what's going we on. We all are, are rooting for them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so we're all rooting for them. Um, we don't know specifically what's going on in Calico. We do know they have an incredibly heavyweight team that's joined them. So uh, names that aren't necessarily uh, famous uh, outside of the biotech space, but incredibly famous within the biotech space. So Cynthia Kenyon being one, uh, Art Levinson, who right, most people Gen know from, from Genentech. Uh, most people know him from Apple, but he was the uh, CEO of Genentech. Uh, so they actually have the ability to not only do the basic science, but to deliver as well. So Google in the past have said that they are looking at delivering over, over long, long view. Uh, we think we can start to see quantification and success within a short term. Right. So. It, it seems almost trivial to be talking about corporate structures when we're talking about a company that's trying to extend human life. But what, what do you think the benefits are of keeping ca taking Calico outside of Google, putting it under Alphabet, or maybe one day even spinning it out as its own entity? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's allowing it to focus, right? So one of the big one of the big issues in life sciences space is allowing flexibility to follow paths that, let's say, a search engine wouldn't follow. Uh, probably additional financing as well. I mean, biotech is expensive, especially when you're talking about therapeutics. So let's say they identify a couple of genes, a couple of proteins that may actually extend healthy lifespan, may delay the onset of Alzheimer's, may delay the onset of heart disease. Uh, those, are, those are drugs that will have to get developed, and we're talking about multiple billion yeah, dollars. So this would free them up to go raise money elsewhere. Go and raise the money on the pub public markets or do other things, do structures that you know, a search engine may, maybe wouldn't do, maybe joint partnerships with pharmaceutical companies. You do wonder, Ohm, don't you, how much of all of this costs? I don't, actually. No. I really don't. I don't think we can quantify what Google is doing on the moonshots in terms of financial returns. Like, if you think about it, Bell Labs invented, you know, the transistor for us, and look at the impact it has had on the entire society. Is there a way to financially quantify? I think AT&T of the past is already gone. The company doesn't exist, but its legacy lives on. Sometimes when you take the long view, you, don't, you can't really take the long view in like what the earnings are going to be a year from now. Mm -hmm. Actually, I love this 
I love Google for turning really ad dollars into something useful for humanity. We also spoke with Google uh, Google Ventures, Bill Maris, who, who's running the venture arm of the company, and he talked about their life science investments. Take a listen. We start with a theme, and, and the theme here is life sciences, where we've put 36% of our capital last year into life science companies. And, and the goal of those companies is to help people uh, not suffer from diseases, not die of congestive heart failure or cancer or the sorts of things that, uh, that affect lifespan. Ryan, can you give me a better idea of how how they're extending human life? Yeah, so the how is is looking at disease itself, right? So so what what is aging, right? Aging is is gradually a set of diseases that eventually kill us, right? So Alzheimer's, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease. Once we start tackling these diseases, lifespan should start to prolong. We've still got a, a, currently a limit, it seems, at about 120 years for the normal human lifespan. Uh, but if you look at other areas where I'm sure Google is involved, uh, and we know several researchers are currently in that space as well, organogenesis, mm -hmm. uh, failing organs that can be replaced and built. Now, Brad, you've actually been inside Google S, well, X. What about the other moonshots? How successful have they been? Well, it's a mixed record, right? I mean, Google Glass probably gets the most attention, and of course that wasn't successful, and right. it moved over to the Nest unit. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the internet connected balloons, right? As far Project as I know, balloon. Project I've been Balloon, inside Project they balloon. are trialing that. Uh, it seems successful, but there are other uh, options to spread internet access to, to developing parts of the world, maybe some which are more capital efficient. Uh, they're dealing with high winds at high altitudes, so we'll see whether that's practical. And then I would say everything else right now remains a kind of miscellaneous inside right. Google X, but certainly you know, promising. And, and if to, this, to the extent that it frees up more capital and more focus for Google X, it's probably a good thing because we all want these things. So their, their next earnings report, we're going to see more transparency. They've promised. We don't know just how transparent uh, it will be. But um, what do you think Alphabet's going to look like, Google aside? Not today, but looking out five years from now, I think of it as essentially a, a holding company very much like Berkshire Hathaway, not perhaps the same, you know, makeup, but looking at big, big swings on, on, on the future of humanity and technology, you know, not everything is going to work out. They will have a lot more companies under their fold. I definitely believe that suddenly there is a revitalization of interest in Google and what it can do in our ecosystem. All right. Oh, Malik of True Ventures, Brad Stone of Bloomberg Businessweek, Ryan Bethencourt of IndieBio, thank you all so much for joining us. I definitely want to see what Alphabet looks like uh, five years from now. We will be watching and covering. That does it for this special edition of Bloomberg West. Thanks so much for watching. Tomorrow, don't miss my interview with Alibaba CEO Daniel Zhang.